From the HBA Podcast Studio in New York City, welcome to The Medium Rules. I'm Alan Baldishan. Quartz Inc., which is spelled with a K. Uh, it's a very similar model to, to Open Table. We need to make sure that a pro can make his bookings while he's holding a racket in his hand. In terms of the ground game, getting clubs on the app and getting adoption. We want to own those clubs. We want to own the supply of those tennis courts. You're disrupting a market. Yeah. You're telling someone what you've been doing for the last 10, 20, 30, 50 years should be done differently today. In terms of Dubai, many people don't know, but there is a lot of a start. There, there is a startup scene there. There's a huge generation right now that were, that, that, that were educated abroad and that you know, were exposed to convenience, technology, and, and to, to, to the way of living in the West. Thank well, you. Thanks for the opportunity, and I uh, yep. hope to see you all on courts. Joining me today in the HBA podcast studio is Walid Fata, the CEO and co-founder of the tennis booking app and club management software platform, Quartz Inc., which is spelled with a K, K-O-U-R-T-S. In this conversation, we're going to take a look at the Quartz platform and functionality, as well as how Quartz is part of a wave of tennis tech startups. We'll also get into the origin story of the Quartz founding team, which you might be surprised to hear, ties into what is a burgeoning tech startup scene in Dubai. Finally, as we're taping, it happens to be week one of the 2018 US Open here in New York City. So as a special bonus for the tennis heads among us, we're gonna get into a little US Open discussion and in that we'll be joined by our tennis player and fan producer, Reese Brassler. So with that, let's get started. Uh, Waleed, thanks very much. Welcome to the Medium Rules. Welcome, and thanks for coming in and sitting down for a conversation. Well, Alan, thanks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and it's a pleasure being here today talking about um, my business and, and my passion. So let's, uh, let's, get into, uh, let's get into Quartz. Um, tell us about your app. Tell us about your, your, your platform, um, what you're doing, what you're tying in, how, how it works, how the, how the business makes money, et cetera. Yeah. Um, l- let me start by saying that you know, the, the business model that we have is what we call a SaaS-enabled marketplace. That's a, that's a technical word where basically you have a, a SaaS, a software as a solution, which is um, in, in every club that's on our platform, it, it helps them manage their entire facility, whether it is um, court sheet with, with timings, whether it's the um, uh, schedule of the, of the instructors, the database of the memberships, uh, the rules of the club, you name it, that's what it does. And then you have the, um, the marketplace that we're creating because that, that software as a solution powers a mobile application. Uh, very similar, it's a very similar model to, to OpenTable for, for, for you and, and the listeners that know OpenTable. OpenTable is a software that's in many, many restaurants and, and it powers a, a marketplace where you can go and pick any restaurant that you want. I think that the difference from what Quartz has done is, is obviously it's the first time that someone creates a marketplace where when you download the app, you have every club that's on our platform there. Um, the difference is obviously Open Table had, had uh, something that was easier. There was no private restaurants. <laughs> yeah, you, if, you're, if you're on Open Table, you can book any restaurant. In, in, a tennis, in the tennis world, it's a bit different because you have obviously private clubs, which today represent about a third of the market. And those private clubs only allow their members to, to book in their clubs. So, so when we built the platform, we had to think of um, every supplier of, of tennis courts. So whether it's a public park, whether it's a, an HOA, whether it's a, a, a country club, uh, a university, a high school, all those tennis courts out there that stay empty, we had to try and build a system that allowed them all to use our platform. The, the mobile app, and, and then I'll talk about it as well, but what's interesting is we, when we built our business plan, we, we, we omitted a huge part of the business, which was the instructors. So we have, we have two apps. We have one for players and one for instructors. The one for players, uh, for you and me and, and members in a particular club, you, you just go on the app. The app will recognize if you're a member in a club or not. Because if you remember earlier, I just said that the, uh, the SaaS product in the club has the entire database of, of the members. So if you add in a member in a club A and your m- mobile number and your email are in that club A's database, we have access to it. So now when you download the app, your phone number is going to go into the main database of courts and it's going to see that you're a member in a particular club. Therefore, that the app will know that you're entitled to book in that club. And obviously, again, that database knows if you're a gold member, a silver member, or bronze, clubs can create their own player types. Um, and you can, you know, if a, if a gold can book from 6 a.m. till 10 p.m., maybe a bronze can only book from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. And therefore, if you're a bronze, 
the app will recognize that you're a bronze and it'll, it'll limit what you can do. Um, so you've got the rules set up in there. That co correct. That correlate with whatever the club booking system is, whatever the rules are. Uh, exactly. And that's why I think that the difficult part of what we built was, was being able to put as many different rules and different type of clubs on one platform. Because you have clubs where, you know, you book a court, and I'm sure you know because I, I, I know you like playing tennis, but mm -hmm. some clubs will allow you to play 60 minutes, some others 45. And then in tennis, you have clay, you have hard court, you have indoor, you have outdoor. There are so many different rules. So we, we really had to you know, take a huge step back in, when we were building our business plan, and we had to think this out. We, we interviewed hundreds of clubs, hundreds of players, hundreds of, of pros as well to really understand what needed to be built. And we, we didn't want to come to the market saying, hey, that's what the market needs. So, so that's one of the first things that we did. The, the second app, which is the instructor app, is, is interesting because when we built our business at first, we thought that that SaaS product, which is a cloud-based, um, web-based software, uh, we thought that the pros would go onto that um, site, uh, they have a password, they would log in, and they would make their own bookings for their classes or for their private lessons for the entire week. We, we forgot that you know, pros, pros are on court all the time. They don't sit with a laptop. So when we, when we realized that, the first thing we did is we said, well, maybe what we should do is continue our business model and create an app, but not for players this time, but for the instructors, for the pros. And that's what we did. And interestingly enough today, if I look at our revenues, I think we're almost at 50-50 when it comes to number of bookings that go through the apps. And 50% is players and 50% is the pros. So the pros have really embraced this. And I think it's incredible because it's creating this community of pros. And I call them our Trojan horses because when you're a pro in a club that's using courts and then you're a pro in another club that's not using courts, now you have that, you know, you, you don't have that convenience of being able to book with your app. You're going to have to go to the tennis director. You're going to have to go to whoever and give your schedule for next week. So now those pros are incredible because they're pushing other clubs that are not on our platform to sign up with us. Wow, that's yeah. interesting. Have, does that change the behavior of, to stay on that for a second, does that... Do pro, had pros been booking their own courts before, prior well, to this yeah. technology? In 90% of the cases, in, in, we're talking the United States here, in 90% of the cases, tennis clubs are managed by pen and paper. That means that someone has, is, you know, has to be in front of that piece of paper to, to take that booking, right? And, and the pros, what they had to do is they usually had to either email or text um, the tennis director, whoever at the reception, they have a few days ahead from players, to say, well, okay, you know, on Tuesday, I have this particular clinic. I need to book my court. Um, on Tuesday, after that clinic, I have, you know, Alan's kids uh, in, in a private lesson. And, and it's all by phone or by text or by email. And then the person at the reception, you know, blocks those courts off. So when we came up with that, the idea of building, a, you know, an, an app to allow them to do that, once again, we had to build something that was so simple that it was, you know, the barrier to entry for a pro to use it had to really be something that it was even more simple than sending a text or sending an email. So we built an app where, and, and, and I remember very well because one of the discussions I had with one of my co-founders, we were like, we need to make sure that a pro can make his bookings while he's holding a racket in his hand. So, so that was, that was what, we, what we started with. That's what you're shooting for. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and, 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 and you know, so, far, so far it's worked out. So, so that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And, and the great thing with that app as well now is for a tennis club that has clinics and, and you have eight people participating into a, to a clinic, into a, um, you know, a tennis camp, usually the pro would take the list of, of the attendants and he would go on court and see who comes there. Well, now with the app, he can also click on his clinic and he sees whoever is supposed to come in and then he can check them in and the reception knows that they were checked in or not. So it suddenly you know, adds a lot of, of value to, to, to what we had built. So staying on the club side for a second, um, what are some of the challenges and maybe distinctions between getting clubs on the platform between private and public? Yeah. Um, the, the, the private clubs, I'd say, I almost want to say, are the easier ones just because obviously if you're a member in a, in a private club, what the private club wants to do is they want to give you value for your membership. So if they can give you a mobile app to book versus you having to call between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. to book, they see the value in it. I always take the example of, you know, if you and I were having dinner tonight and, and it's quarter to 10 at night and I would tell you, hey, Alan, let's play tomorrow morning at 7. Well, you know, you, you can't call your club then and there because the reception is closed. 
we and, and to that point i had a i had our tech uh, do a bit of research so right now obviously our products are live and and we have hundreds of bookings every day i i asked our tech team to to give me an average time at which people pull their app out of their pocket and make their booking for the next day or for the couple of next days or, or whenever that is and I always ask clubs, what time do you think it is? So I'll do the same thing with you. What time do you think people pull their phone out of their pocket to make the booking for the next day or, or the next plane? 9, 9.30, I'm going to say. A.M. or P.M.? I'm going to say P.M. Oh, wow. Okay, well, 9.47 P.M. You're kidding. Yeah, well, kids You know, I, I was literally thinking to myself, when do I, yeah. I make that decision the night before? It looks like, you know, like I'm... I'm emailing around who's around feel like pointing yeah. tomorrow yeah, that exactly. is the you're That's not booking a week in advance nope. is the point exactly yeah. and, and yeah. i think that what's interesting you know kids are in bed you've had dinner yes. you have time to think That's you know, right. you're, you're, everyone's working and everyone's active every day and then you know it's 9 47 and you're going to make your booking but your club's closed you're not going to play that next day so the convenience of letting a player decide when he wants to go and make that booking we truly believe that that's what's going to make more play occasions happen because thousand percent. you know if if 9:47 my reception is closed i'm not going to play that next day because i'm busy as soon as i wake up bring the kids to school go to work and and now the booking is done right you know that is that is absolutely uh true in the sense that for me i play a lot on public courts in new york city mm -hmm. and so i can do that like 9:47 I can text Reese, who we play, and I'll meet you at 7 o'clock at 119th Street, and we don't have to. But had that not been the case, I would play a lot less. Now, if, if I could make that booking electronically, you're, gonna, you're just going to get a ton more plays. Yeah, yeah. So to, to come back to the, to, to the second part, uh, you, you were asking me about you know, private clubs versus parks and, and, parks and recs. Mm -hmm. I, again, I, I, I have no doubts that going forward, you know, once once the message is clear to a park and a recreation center, they'll see the value in what we're doing. But I think that there's there's uh, there's there's two issues there. The first one is in a lot of cases when we speak to parks and recreations, and, and I hope they're listening. Um, the the people that manage the recreational side, tennis or whatever it is, uh, from from the recreational side, um, are not passionate. They're, they're doing their job right, and I'm not criticizing that, but they're not passionate enough about tennis. So for them. The number of people on court, how pe how much people are enjoying playing on those facilities, is not a, a main driver, and and well that that's one of the first issues. The the second issue is with the with the park and recreations, is in a lot of cases some of the facilities are not manned, so it is what we call first come first served. So you know you and again we t take the example of Reese. I don't know about New York well enough, but there's a lot of park and recreations on on the West Coast where. You can just grab a racket, go, and, and you know, you're the first one there, you hit. And if someone comes after you, they, there's, a, there's a ridiculous way of putting a racket in the fence so that you know, you know you're second. It's and a version of that here. I mean, oh, basically, okay. yeah. Well, it's I'm, it's, I'm it's a surprised. version of that, yeah. yeah. So, so, but, but to, to, to try and, and, and fix that issue, we, we've been speaking to two factories in China right now, and, and it's pretty interesting because what we said is we'd even be willing to finance this, but we would put locks on those gates with a QR code, for instance, where you have that booking, you take your phone, you scan that QR code, that QR code recognizes which gate it is, and it recognizes that you have a booking in that, on that court, therefore the gate would open, right? So, so that's one of the pilot projects that we're trying to do now, now with one of the cities. But you know, again, if I take the example of California, where we're based, we're in Venice Beach, uh, we, have a, we have a couple of cities down there that, that use our platform, and you know, they can't get enough of it. So, so once again, I think once they understand the model and, and, and the added value for the residents, for the health of their people, that you know, they can access tennis easier, I think it's a no-brainer. I, I look at you know, uh, many, many cities, and, and we have people all around the U.S., and, and I look at how a, um, um, a, a city promotes their programs. And, and quarterly, you get, a, you, know, you get a little leaflet in your, in your mailbox, and you have the different programs that are there. I mean, how efficient is that yeah. you know, in, in 2018? So... Flipping a little bit into the player side, um, is the customer acquisition strategy for is, are you are you getting at players through clubs or do you have a strategy to get tennis players raise awareness, get them on the app, get them booking? Yep. What's yeah, your yeah. sort of game it's, plan there to drive adoption? It's a, it's a it's it's a 
It's a very, very um, loaded question <laughs> <laughs> because, because it's, it's pretty simple. When you create a marketplace, you've got to have supply. You own, you own no market unless you have supply. So our strategy from day one was never to go out after the, the players. Our strategy from day one was to convince the clubs. And if I take an analogy and I'll take, uh, I, don't, I don't like taking analogies, but sometimes for people to understand it's, it's, it's better. But if you take Uber as an example or Lyft, I, I can take either of them. Um, if the first time you downloaded their app and you, hail, you, know, you, you try to call a car and it was 58 minutes out, You'd say you're done. That, that's not for me. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hail a cab, right? And and rightly so. But Uber were pretty good and Lyft as well. That they they you know they owned the market before they went and promoted their app. So 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 again in in in, in the same example, what we're doing right now. And if I take Los Angeles as an example, Los Angeles is 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 again being a, a headquarters in our test city. Wherever you are in the city today, under four miles, you can get a court. So. Now it becomes interesting. On courts? On courts. Is yes. that right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. you've really... Uh, yeah, so, so when, you, when you can start doing that, that's when you can start going for the, for the players now, yeah. right? And, and our strategy when it comes to the players is obviously you know, a lot of marketing, and, and that's where a lot of dollars will be spent. But, but mostly you know, social media mm -hmm. is, is huge. Obviously, we all know that with the influencers. Um, I also truly believe that you know, the way we've been able to, to create such a huge database is clubs see the value in what we do and, and they push their players to yeah. use our apps. So, so when you have that, you have a natural inflow. I mean, every day we have people downloading their apps and it's because they've heard of it from their court, from their clubs, from other players in those clubs. W what we do, and, and that's, one of the, that's one of the ways we, we built our database, we, um, the, the clubs are very happy about this. They're like, well, if we could inform all our members about the court's platform, um, we'd love to do that. So we do a mass email to their entire database saying that, you know, that club now is, is on the courts database, sure. uh, sorry, on the courts platform and that they can download the app. And as soon as they do it, obviously, as I explained to you earlier, because of the architecture, it recognizes that they're a member in that specific club. And now they can go and book their courts. We, we have, you know, plenty of, of reviews that we receive and, and it's always, you know, Rick and Farting, Rick and Farting and, and, and we're all proud about, proud about it, the entire team. But when you hear, you know, happy tennis players that say, this is so great, you know, it's something that's very, very exciting sure. for us. So, so again, th th for us today, the B2B, the, uh, 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 our software is something that we want to promote way more than, than the apps themselves. Although, and, and we can discuss about the business model, the revenue comes from the apps. The revenue comes from the place. Y yeah. Well, so, so what we've done, and again, the, the idea here is convincing a club to come on the platform. You want, you know, barrier to entry to be as low as possible. And, and for a lot of them, they're coming from pen and paper. So when you're taking that from pen and paper to digitalizing it, it's a huge step. And now if you're going to put a big, you know, big cost on that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure everyone would just jump at it. So what we've done is our business model, and, and that's good for the players to know, is we always said if we want to be convenient for the players, we don't want the price to be more expensive on the app versus in your parks and rec where you go, or if you had to even pay when you're a member in a club. So what we do is we charge a fee, a fixed fee per transaction, to the clubs when someone uses the mobile apps. So if someone continues calling a club, which you know in a lot of cases where it still is the case, um, the club will just enter the booking into the on, onto our software. We don't we don't charge anything for the software, and and with the software they get all the data about their club. They see occupancy rate by 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 day, by week, by gender, by I mean you know data is just unlimited on on on, on the tech that we've built. Um, so, so the revenue really comes from whenever someone uses the app. We're, we're a convenient company. We want to make things convenient for tennis players because we know that if it's convenient, uh, as I said earlier, um, th they'll book more courts. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, in terms of the ground game with respect to getting clubs on the app and getting adoption, what is your, what I, I, are, are you, is it regional? Is it, I mean, how are you scaling that? Yeah. What, what's your, so we were, we were pretty lucky from the get go. We, we, we signed a partnership with, with a few um, big um, associations out here in the U S to try and really understand the demographics of tennis. So, so even before we put a first line of code, even before I found a co-founder, I, 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 I came to the U S I was based in Dubai at the time and, and I came to the U S and I had to see the total addressable market. Because you don't start a business without knowing the size of the market and, and how you know how you can penetrate it. So 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 when I when I did that, I was like, okay, now I know 
how many tennis clubs. Now I know how many, this is all approximate, obviously, but how many tennis players, how many play occasions. But the beauty now is I know where those tennis clubs are. So what we did is we, we mapped out all those clubs on a Google map. And now we know where, you know, the big chunk of the market is. And, and again, to, to the same analogy I took earlier about, you know, Uber and Lyft, you don't have one driver in one city, five drivers in another city, 100 drivers in another one. What you do is you own a market. So for us, California has always been a huge focus because that's where we started last year. And, and we didn't branch out until we knew that our business model was right, that the product worked, that the consumers were happy using it. So, you know, you, you listen to every single comment that comes from a club and from a player. It's not always, you know, you, you don't always enjoy it, but it's very, very important because sure. you got to listen to your consumers. And, and when, we, when we did that and we, we realized, you know, okay, w- we got this right and, and California started growing, that's when we, again, thanks to, to, to mapping out all those clubs, we always knew that, you know, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia was going to be a huge market for us, that Florida is going to be a huge market for us, the tri-state obviously as well. So, so right now what we've done is after, after we did California, the, the, the second investment that we did is, is opening a presence out in Atlanta. I mean, uh, Alta, which is the largest tennis league in, in the U.S., which is 84,000 tennis players, which is huge, and this is just Atlanta. Um, uh, they have a huge appetite for tennis. So, so now this is soon going to get, you know, become our, our largest market. Um, we now have also opened a presence in, in, uh, in, in Florida, in West Palm Beach. So we have someone there that's now starting to, to sign the clubs and we're going to grow those teams and we're going to, you know, grow the number of clubs and then we can promote the app to players over there. Yeah. We're doing the same thing in Chicago right now. Chicago is a, a big place as well, Illinois, for, for tennis. So, uh, you know, California, Florida, Illinois, uh, Georgia, our first markets. And then we're now we're looking for the tri-state area. We've hired someone as well now in New England. So we're starting New England uh, mid, mid-September. And, and again, the great thing about tech is once, once you have the tech and, and you've built it to scale, the, the issue will not be with tech. It'll be obviously on, on the sales front. Okay. Um, well, let's uh, – before we leave uh, courts and get into uh, how you guys came together um, – Talk a little bit about your competitive set. Um, Andy Murray recently came out with an announcement about Deuce in England. Mm -hmm. There are a few other booking apps. How is Quartz different? How do you sort of compare and contrast yourself and and your company to some of the other guys in the space? It's a, it's a, again, it's a very important question because w- when, again, when you start a business, you got to look at obviously the total addressable market and you got to, lo- you got to find out who's, who's there and who's doing well, yeah. right? And, and that's the first thing, well, maybe the second thing that we did. And, and we did a lot of research about all the SaaS products, all the softwares that were out there. And there's some incredible softwares out there that we're up against. And, you know, you, you would, you, you'd think that we're nuts to do that. But one thing that we were very lucky about, and, and that's the beauty about technology is, you have a lot of softwares out there that built technology back in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, where mobile applications were not out. So the companies that we're up against have those incredible softwares, but they're what we call silos. So, so let's take the same example as I took earlier with you being a member in Club A. If that Club A is using one of those softwares, it's great because you can go online, www.myfavoritetennisclub.com, and you put your email and your password, and now you know you have a court sheet where you can p- make your booking. In most of them, you see everyone else that's playing. So you see everyone's name. Uh, I'm, I'm from Switzerland where privacy is something that is you know, very important, ba- banking being my background. We said we don't want people to see everyone's names. So, so we, we use the different technology. But, but to continue on, on the subject, all those, all those big IT companies that do club management if they wanted to do what we're doing with an open architecture where you have gotcha. all the clubs on one platform, they would have to refactor their entire tech. And again, I don't like using analogies, but I do it a lot. If you think of GM and you think of Tesla, Tesla has something that's incredible. They've only done electric cars, so they have no legacy. Whereas if GM tomorrow wanted to produce electric cars only, they're, they're totally dependent today on, on the petrol industry. So, so to come back to the analogy I was making about you know, t- Tesla and, 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 um, and, and GM, if very similarly for us, when you look at these softwares, for them to have to change their entire technology to be able to create a marketplace is, I mean, it's a huge feat on its own. So, so 
from from a software standpoint, we have that competition. But now what we've realized is that, you know, the technology that we've built and, and we've done something that's so tennis centric that we've been able to take, you know, some some clubs that were using some of those softwares before we've taken them over. So so that I think that's pretty interesting when it comes to the marketplace. When um, we did a, a round of financing last year and, and, and you, Alan, taught us a, a lot of uh, things, uh, thanks to your practice. Oh, thank you. Um, when, when we had to go and register the fact that we had raised uh, funds with the SEC, that was public and, and you warned me about that. But what was interesting is straight after we announced it, we had an inflow of emails of VCs, first of all, of course, because that's their job. But then we had an inflow of, of, of emails from other apps that were out there. And, and I don't consider them as competition for, for two reasons. The first of all is you have a lot of them that are uh, player matching, right? So they try and put two people together. Okay. There's, there's no financial model behind that. Th their, their dream is to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to mix Walid and, and Alan together and, and they'll get a great game. And, you know, we're just going to build more and more people. And when we have 5,000... Almost 000, a social we, dimension. Well, yeah, yeah almost. Something. But, but for them, the, the, you know, the revenue model, and I've had that conversation with them, is like, oh, you know, when we have 10,000 users, what we can do is we can go to n the Nikes of the world, the Babolats of the world, mm. and then, you know, we can sell them the database so they can make advertising on it. The problem is those guys usually raise, you know, $100,000, $200,000. They learn how to code. They build that. And they never get to those amounts. And, and to be honest with you, I doubt that someone like, you know, Babolat, Wilson, Nike, to, to only mention a few would see that much value in 5,000 people mm -hmm. that, that are on the platform. So, so when, when they came to us, it, it you know, gave me a, big, a, a good perspective of, of what was out there when it came to apps. There's a few of the ones, and, and, and Deuce, the one that you mentioned, you know, we, I, I don't say we don't look at what competition does because that's not what drives us, but it's always good to know what's in that space. I, I think that, you know, um, great that Andy in invested money in it and I think it's good that tennis professional players you know invest back into the sport because it's a way of giving back to the sport and I think it's important to so to support the sport but but the way they did it is w when that announcement came out I, I went to try and find what Deuce was it was nowhere to be found the technology was not finished it was not live yet so you know that silver bullet that that, that you know not many people get to use uh, I thought was kind of wasted and then what they wanted to do is they wanted to be again you know a, a matching platform as I said earlier uh, in this podcast, you you have to own a market. You have to own supply. So for us, getting people to play together is great, but that's further down the road. What we want today is we want we want to own those clubs. We want to own the supply of those tennis courts. Because if if again, if we take the example, if one of those apps matches you and I, but we don't have a court, we're not playing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whereas what we're doing at courts is you want to you want to play tennis. You can book a court. Once you have a court, what we're building, one of the next, uh, in, in our product roadmap, one of the next big chapters is we'll be able to match you with another player. But the beauty now is that obviously we have revenue because there's a court that's been done through the app. And you know that when you're making a booking, you're going to get a partner. And the reason why we haven't released it there, and, and there's no secret, I think, again, when, when, when you're a startup, you got to talk about your ideas and, and the execution is everything, not the idea. The, the, the secret behind what we're doing is we will release player matching when we have a big enough amount of players in one city. And, and that way, I'm sure that when, Alan, you download the app and you want to use it to, to find a partner, you're not going to be like the guy waiting for his Lyft Uber and 58 minutes out. So, so that's also part of the strategy that we have. You get enough clubs, you get enough courts. Once you have enough courts, you have enough players from those clubs. You start promoting the app to get more players, and then you do player matching. Yeah. So so that's how, how that's how we're seeing it. So again, in, in when it comes to 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 competition, I I see it on the software on the back end side, on marketplaces. No, I don't see anyone that's built something that 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 you know is not a yellow pages of tennis clubs where you can you can click and and, and it'll send an email to that club or or you can click and you know and it it, it for us the supply that you have on the app is real supply. You click that court at 4 p.m., you pay 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 dollars, 100 dollars sometimes in New York, you have that court that's booked. It's not sending an email to a club saying, hey, we have someone that would be interested in playing in your club tomorrow. Clubs, and, and I hate saying this live, but but clubs don't read emails. Yeah. Clubs, you know, they, they, they run the tennis facilities and, and they don't, they're not very good at answering and emails. They, 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 they do things the way they're used to doing it's, things, uh, principally. It's, exactly. Yeah. So that's one of the things when we go and we speak to a club, they've been, you know, you, you're disrupting a market. Yeah. You're telling someone what you've been doing for the last 10, 20, 30, 50 years should be done differently today. 
And, and it goes back to, to our business plan originally when we were looking at the demographics of the U.S. So if you listen to, to the Tennis Industry Association, you look at their numbers. We're saying that in the U.S. you have approximately 18 million tennis players. They're not all active, but you have 18 million tennis players. And you have 28,000 tennis facilities. So facilities versus club, meaning it could be a high school, as I said, it could be a park, it could be a private club. I tell clubs all the time, I'm like, who decides? You or the 18 million consumers, right? And, and that's where I think, you know, the, the consumer is the one that decides and you got to tell the club, you know, if you guys don't get on the train or you're exactly, going to be left behind. E yeah. Exactly. I, imagine if a hotel is not on, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an aggregated um, uh, software. Yeah. Uh, hotel sorry. tonight or whatever, exactly. whatever it may be. Yeah. It's interesting, but I can tell you they'll get way less business. Yeah. And, you know, when I travel, I don't go into, you know, uh, Hyatt.com and click that specific hotel. I go and I look at, you know, what's the cheapest Most room I can do get. Days, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if you're not one of those, you're, you're, you know, you're dead in the water. Yeah. And I kind of feel that tennis is no different because, you know, consumers that go into hotel rooms are the ones that play on tennis courts. Yeah. So let me, let me, that's a, that's actually a good segue in terms of how you guys came together. So you're, you, you, you were in Dubai and, and you'll, you'll tell me the story, but this team really originated and formed in Dubai. Correct. Um, Tell me that story. In other words, what was sort of the, the, the way that, that you sort of identified this pain point, this this is what you wanted to do, and yep. then got this group together? Yeah. So, so you know, in, in life, I, I, I believe in, in timing. I don't know if luck is the right word. I think luck, you provoke luck. But but I believe in timing. And, and I was I was living in Dubai. I, I was fortunate enough to have a career in banking, work, worked for the second largest bank of Switzerland, Credit Suisse, had lived in Geneva, and in where I grew up, in Zurich, in New York, in Singapore, in Dubai, and in Africa. And, and I played tennis, you know, in all those different cities and countries. And when I was a kid, you know, tennis was my sport, but I knew from an early age I wasn't going to be good enough to, to, to take that professional. But I always kept, you know, an am amateur game and, and enjoyed playing. But every single city, country I had lived in, that pain point of trying to book a court was the same. And even more so when you traveled and you didn't know where you were, I mean, you, di you didn't know the tennis environment where you were going. So I was like, this, how can this be possible? This is 2015. How is this possible with the technology that we have out there to have to pick up a phone to call to book a court? I mean, today, you know, I took the example of open table. You, you don't need to call a restaurant anymore. You don't need to call a cab service anymore. You don't need to call, you know, Delta or American Airlines to book a flight. Seamless to order food. I mean, take out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so I mean, these are all habits that we have today. You, you can, on, on the Chase app, you can transfer fifty thousand dollars without speaking to someone. But booking a court, you have to speak to someone. How, how is that even remotely the possible? The travel, right? uh, the travel example is is a great exactly. one because it's it's you you just don't do it. I, I mean, you, you, unless you're at a hotel that has a court I, and they're going to find somebody, you're going to hit with a pro for a hundred yeah, bucks. Yeah. You got it. So. So I had, I had that idea. So what I did then is, is this is summer of 2015. I, I flew to, to California. I, I, like, I like hot weather. I was living in Dubai. And, <laughs> and I went to see the space of tennis. So I, that's where I started interviewing clubs and, and looking at how you know, the poor the solutions um, they were using. And I did that all the way up to, to New York where I came for the U.S. Open again three years ago. And I was like, okay, there's got to be something here. And that's when, again, I started talking to the USTA, to the TIA, all those different associations, and, and to try and understand the size of the space. And, and, and back then, when I was living in Dubai, and I think that's interesting, um, a, my best friend, I had moved from, uh, from Geneva to, to Dubai in 2005. One of my best friends uh, had moved at the same time. He was starting a, a media company out in, uh, out, in, out, out in Dubai. It was, you know, the real estate boom back in 2005. And, and what he wanted to do, him and his partner had a, had a physical magazine that was coming out every, every other week uh, with all listings of all uh, rentals and, and, and apartments and, and villas for sale. And, and they started that on, on you know, on, on, again, it's a, it was a paper um, uh, print. And long story short, in 2008, they converted that and they went digital. And, and they created a company called PropertyFinder.ae, which is equivalent to the, the Redfins or the Zillows of, of, that you have out here. Um, Dubai was a huge, again, you know, huge market for real estate back at the time. So it still so is, I mean, of course, it still yeah, is, it yeah. still is. So, but, but what was interesting is obviously through the transition of going from paper to, to tech, to, to digital, um, his name is Michael Layani. M Michael obviously learned so much about how do you scale a business? So when I came back from the U S I, I sat with him and I'm like, listen, Michael, um, you know, I, I know you have, you know, you, you have your, your real estate portal and it's linked to an app and, and we started talking about it. And, and what was great, again, is having someone like him, like a mentor, tell me, well, okay, great. You have an idea now. It's in your head. Put it on paper. Try and see what it looks like on paper, right? And, and that's when it complicates things. 
because you think we actually have to work. We're, exactly. <laughs> we're going to create an app and people are just going to be able to click on a, on a button and, and book a court and pay. Okay, well, now, what could be different? Someone might have to cancel that booking. Uh, you have different surfaces. Uh, you might not be a member in a club. So that's when, you know, I put everything down on paper and, and I started doing that and it took months. And, and back at the time, Michael, again, with, 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 his, with his mentorship, he told me, you need to bring people on board. You need to have the skills that you don't have. I mean, I, I knew as much about tech as you do with your iPhone, most probably, right? And I had a BlackBerry back at the time. So, so, so I was like, yeah, you're 100% right. So, so I knew that from his side, you know, he was committed to, to helping me build this. Uh, obviously, he was running a, a 300 employee business, so he had you know, limited um, uh, time to, to help me with this. But at the time, he was acquiring a company out in Dubai called Dubi Cars. It was the equivalent of Auto Trader and Cars.com that you have out here in the US. And one of the co founders was a, 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 a Swedish gentleman called Tim Whelan. Um, Michael said, Listen, I've dealt with this guy for eight months when I was buying you know, his, his company out. Uh, he's someone that you need on board. I'm like, Listen, let's do one thing. Let me meet him, but I don't want to pitch him the business. I want to see if I can work with this guy because obviously your co-founders, you spend more time with them than your family and then whoever else. So um, he set the appointment up and that was by then it's early 16, 2016. And I sat with Tim. We had planned on having a coffee for 15 minutes. It lasted two and a half hours. Great guy. And, uh, and and he was based in Dubai. So at he the time. was exactly he was based in Dubai because Dubi Cars was built in Dubai. He had worked. Dubi Cars. Okay. Yeah, he would. He had. He was previously SAP and IBM. So so he knew. I wouldn't say the tech world, but but he knew. Certainly knew enterprise e exactly. platforms. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and, and and with his experience with <coughs> sorry with Dubi uh, with Dubi Cars, he had learned how to scale a business. So that was very very interesting. Interesting when it came to the operational side of our business. And so, you know, we, we, we met back then and he was, he was burnt out and, and, you know, what he had built in Dubai. So he wanted to go kite surfing around the world. So he went to South Africa and he went to Asia for three months. All that time I was, you know, still doing my research on my own and, and continuing doing what I was doing. And, you know, he said he'd be back on, I think it was 27th of March. So on the 28th of March, I called him up and he came to my office in Dubai and, and I pitched him. And the interesting thing is, you know, I had a, I had a deck. I was, I was, I was really not young, but immature i had a 62 page deck <laughs> uh, no one has a 62 page deck you have a 12 page deck is more than enough so but what was interesting is when i was on page 44 going to page 45 his question on page 44 the answer was on page 45 so so he understood very quickly what we were building so so when when him and i then joined forces in june 2016 that's when we really started you know building building the product and we knew, of course, that we'd have to bring someone that knows how to do tech. And, and when I'm saying do tech is not design it, but create it. So we, we tried, we interviewed people all around the world. Um, obviously, we, we checked in the US, we checked in India, we checked everywhere. We looked at pricing, but not only pricing, we looked at the quality of the code. We found an incredible team that was out in Poland. And um, we, we, we tested them. And, and the person that helped us test them was one of the um, one of the engineers that was working for Michael at the time at Property Finder in Dubai. Uh, his name is Ricardo Benegas, and and Ricardo is an incredible um, uh, uh, tech specialist. Uh, he's worked again all around the world, all the way down to Australia, where where he's helped scale businesses thanks to his tech. He's from Sweden as well, same as Tim is, and and funny enough, them they were in high school together. So so their relationship is more than twenty years old, and and Michael and I as as, as well. So you know we and you're all still friends. Oh yeah. Well, we're not only <laughs> friends; we're co-founders now. Yeah. So, so it, it all worked out exactly. Right. So, but but so I, I sat with Ricardo and and we had long conversations and and one day he turned around and he says, you know, I'd be interested. And I was like, what? You're so senior. Why would you be interested in this? He's like, this is exciting. So we sat in Dubai. We had a three and a half hour meeting. We we drew what it would look like, and he said, I'm in. So I told Michael and I told uh, Tim. I'm like, hey. We, we found a, a chief technology officer and, and, and Ricardo joined us. He was living in Dubai. He moved back to Sweden. So he's in our, we have, we have offices in Sweden and in and, 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 and the US. So, so he's based in our offices in Sweden. He comes to California once a month. And then what we had to do is we had to hire the tech guys. And what we had done is when we had interviewed all those different you know, tech companies around, uh, around the world, we had found this team that was in Poland. And they had built something that was similar to what we've built, but for spas and hairdressers. Now, I have the same haircut as you do, so I don't know how Im important that is, but there's a lot of those spas and hairdressers, and they had built the same logic. I mean, they had built a project it's a to similar. Do that. It's the exact same yeah, logic. Yeah. You, you have six chairs, 
you have six courts, you have four pros, you have four headdresses, and you, you can't take more than your capacity. So they had built something that was very, very similar. So, so you know, the great thing about Poland, you know, it's a 35 million uh, people uh, country. It's a very powerful country, very, very ahead when it comes to tech in Europe. And um, we started working with them. And, and you know, from day, from day one, which the first line of code was in December 2016, uh, we realized that we had found the right team. Okay. So, so that was something that was pretty good. And, and Ricardo manages that team. And what we even did going forward is, um, and again, under the advice of, of Michael, he's like, you know, when you own a restaurant, but you don't have your own kitchen and you're outsourcing the kitchen, you're the slave of that kitchen. So in July of 2017, I was, I was uh, in, in our Swedish offices and, and speaking to, to uh, Tim and Ricardo, and we were discussing about that. And we were like, okay, before this gets too big, we need to go and speak to those guys in Poland. So I flew to Poland the next day and I made an offer to the owner of that dev house and we bought them out. Bought them out, integrated them, built our own office out in, in Warsaw, Poland, and now we have a tech team of nine people working for us out there. Never look back. Ne oh, yeah. no, no, That's no, such a great uh, yeah. instructive lesson. Yeah. Very quickly, in terms of Dubai, you know, many people don't know, but there is a lot of a start. There, there is a startup scene there. I mean, you know, tell, tell me a little bit about that scene in terms of, you know, yep. the type of tech that's focused on, yep. how it gets funded. Uh, is, it, is it principally Gulf state? Is it, uh, right, what's so that look like? It's a great question. If, if you look at the space of, of, you know, venture capitalists back 10 years ago in, in Dubai, it was really the beginning. I mean, you know, you, you, you had the big, you know, VCs uh, on the West Coast here in the US, but it was a market that was not really looked at. But, but when you look at the penetration of smartphones in, in the GCC, we're more than 100% penetration. A lot of people have two phones. And again, the, the, the fact that you know, you're, you're in those countries, they all are about convenience. So for them, using mobile apps, using you know, digital platforms is something that made a lot of sense. But I think it, it took quite a while for foreign investors to think, hey, you know what, let's go and see what's happening in the Middle East. Um, so I'd say uh, the, the first movers, I think, were Europeans, and then Americans came and saw the space. But initially, a lot of the money was, was raised locally uh, from you know, friends and family, and, and, and then, then they realized that you know, this was something that was viable. And, and that's when I think you have Europe that started seeing some of the interest that was, that was coming out of, uh, of the Middle East and started investing money. We, we don't have, well, I should say they, I've, I've been out of Dubai for almost two years now. There hasn't been a unicorn yet. But there's a lot of money that's been flowing in now from, you know, from the U.S. as well into those countries. You have those local companies. I was talking about Property Finder. They, they, they raised uh, quite a bit of amount of money two years ago from a Swedish fund. Um, you have you know, Amazon that's out there right now. Yep. Um, and, and obviously what's happened, I'd say, in the, next, in the last three to five years, you have a lot of local funds that have picked up. They've raised money. They've raised money locally. They've ra raised money outside. And now they're, they're funding the local market. You have companies like Fetcher, uh, F-E-T-C-H-R, um, that did a pretty big round of financing. If I'm not mistaken, they, they raised $75 million okay. last year. So, so we're talking you know, significant tickets and for, I think for Amazon. those markets. And, and Amazon, when they, yeah, with, with Soup.com. Pot, pot, pot too. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and that was a pretty, pretty, pretty big deal. And now what's happening, because everyone talks about, when we talk about you know, Dubai and, and, and the Middle East, we talk about the sovereign wealth funds, whether it's Dubai, whether it's Abu Dhabi, whether it's Qatar or, or Saudi Arabia. But what's interesting is, those those are those are those are, those sovereign wealth funds tend to invest a lot of money outside in technology, but what they've done lately now is they have their own VC funds. So now they're looking at the local market and they're looking at local opportunities, which I think is great for the local market to be able to be you know self sustainable to a certain extent. Are the founders uh, principally expats or Emiratis? So th there's a bit of a there's a bit of a mix. Um, I think the incredible thing in in that region as well is that there's there's a huge generation right now that were that that, that were educated abroad, and that you know were exposed to convenience technology and and to 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 the way of living in the West. Uh, so so they're very very capable, and I, and you know a lot of those ventures have started with with locals, but as as you may know and. Uh, you know, the, the UAE, 90 percent of the population is is, uh, is expatriates. So obviously that fuels a lot of the of the manpower of, of, of the, the human capital uh, out there. So a lot a lot of these of those um, of those um, uh, funded uh, startups have foreigners in it. Some expat. Yeah, of course. So we're going to switch gears a little bit, uh, Waleed, and uh, I'm going to invite Reese 
Brassler, my producer, into the conversation. So, Reese, uh, swing your chair around, get in front of the camera, and uh, let's do a little U.S. Open uh, conversation. Well, okay. Let's take advantage of the timing here. All right. So, welcome, Reese. Hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks for joining the conversation. Hey, happy to join. Happy to join. There you it's go. an exciting time. Um, so, here we are. Uh, when this uh, goes live, we're going to be Friday of week one. Mm-hmm. Um, Tell me, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Wally. What, do you, what, do you, what are you looking for in the Open this year? I, I think, I mean, every year the U.S. Open is just such an incredible show. It's something that is so entertaining, whoever's playing. Obviously, you know, I, have, I, have, I have a favorite. I'm, I'm from Switzerland. A rooting interest, obviously sure. Obviously, a rooting interest. Yeah. Yeah. Who could be from Switzerland? Well, there's, your, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of them. A couple so, of guys. So, yeah. so let's see who, go, who goes all the way down. But obviously, you know, uh, Roger, I think um, with the run that he's had and, and since he's come back from his injury, he's been incredible. And I don't, I don't think it's any different right now. Um, I think a lot of the guys, the older guys, are playing incredibly well. You look at you know Rafa again with what he did uh, you know in, in, in Canada and what what he did last night and just the way he's playing is incredible. Uh, look at Del Potro, he's still there. I mean all the older guys, it's incredible. So Reese, uh, give me your thoughts so far. It looks like Stan's looking very good on the men's side. Obviously yeah. Simona got uh, knocked out on the women's side. What are you looking forward to in the next? I use uh, Stan's racket, uh, his old racket. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm a little partial to Stan. I like Stan. <laughs> um, I I'm just really excited about watching Novak play this tournament because he looks so good going in, um, playing at the Masters at Cincy. He just was unbelievable. Um, so I'd like to see. I mean, not that I want Novak to win, but I, I think it would be good for the game if Novak's just back. You know, it's good to see. You know, like Rafa, top form, better you know, coming back from the injury, playing in pretty good form, and then Novak being back, and then hopefully Stan, too. I wonder, speaking of the big four, I wonder what happens with Andy. I mean, he's, he's sort of struggled to come back. You know, I, What's I think... What's the word on I, I think, I, again, for the little knowledge I have about, about health, but I think that when these guys, like the Potro having surgery on your wrist, um, Djokovic having surgery on your elbow, when you're a tennis player, your hip, your knees, I mean, you know, Stan, his knee, Andy, his hip, I mean, we're talking... We're talking, you know, surgery. We're talking something that's invasive, and and those guys are using their body way more than you and I. And I. So, so I think that it's got to take its toll after a while, and, and you can try and fix something. But, you know, I don't know how how uh, Nick is going to play just because you know he pulled out last uh, was in Cincinnati because his his hip was hip uh, was hurting, and he's still a young guy. But those guys put so much pressure on their body that you know it's it's one thing that you know you're playing well i think what roger and, and, and the top four have been able to do is they've been able to keep their level and stay healthy which is something that i think you know some of the younger guys coming out there and i remember talking about how how many tournaments dominic theme does yeah. a year i mean this guy is putting so much pressure on his body what's it going to be in five years from now you yeah. know can, can the body sustain it well and we saw ferrer go out yeah, last well, night with the injury and we yeah. saw you know the canadian go out too yeah, so. Felix, uh, yeah. It's sad when you see these guys that have worked so hard all year round, uh, and when is that important moment? You know, something is not there, and, and, and physically or sometimes mentally as well. I mean, tennis is a very, very mental game, as, as you both know. When you have to think about the humidity too, how hot and nasty it's yeah. been, that like it, it just it destroys your body. With out the there. weather, hopefully changing for the second week, as it always does. Let me ask you this, Reese: Who do you think that uh, any any breakthroughs that you're looking for? Anyone that maybe not totally on our radar screen that, that, that you think might surprise. I mean, Going he's probably on the radar, but, uh, I mean, again, like, Jack Sock just got so much talent in the ball, the way it comes off his racket, the spin he puts in the ball. It's just – he's unbelievable to watch. He just doesn't put it together. I would love yeah. to see him, especially at the U.S. Open, uh, you know, string a couple matches together yeah. and do something. Like, he had that great shot last night yeah. where he did, like, a little spin and then, like, stood there. Didn't expect it to come back, but – he was in position, put it away. It was, well, funny. It was I, fun. I love Jack's Hawk's game as well, and, and you're right. I, I, he doesn't seem to get to the next. Uh, but, but, but to what we said earlier, I think I, I would rather, and, and I wouldn't want, you know, obviously to, to, to take any um, chances away from the Rogers and, 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 and those guys, which, which deserve it because they're, they're still the top of the game. But I think that for the game, if now you have some youngsters that come through and break through with a different style and something a little bit different, I think it's not a bad thing for tennis. I think it's only normal, right? You have generations sure. that go through when, when Roger came and when, when Rafa came, although he's a little younger, you know, they, they, they changed generations. And I think it's only normal after a while that it happens again. And I think tennis is ready for it. You know, it's, uh, it's been incredible to have the top four being around for so long. But I, I, I believe that for the sport, what would be good is you have two youngsters and then they, they come and they battle it out in the finals. And I think that's something that would be great for tennis. That would be exciting. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it'd be great for tennis in terms of us being as fans. I, I don't know how great 
would be in terms of like viewership for ESPN yeah, sure. or like the, the tournament in general. But I mean, sure. I think at some point we have to move on to the yes. next gen. Like it can't just keep being these four guys. Like what's going to happen when Roger <laughs> retires? What's going to happen when Rafa retires? It's just, it's going to be there. You know, it just as maybe a final thought, what I think has been sort of serendipitously nice is that these guys have stayed at the top of their game for so long into their mid thirties that it's given a chance for us to get to know the next gen. True. So that when, when, when they do break through, they're going to be already household names, certainly for tennis fans, even the average yeah. casual tennis fan. We know who they are. True. I, I think that, you know, look at what Serena's doing uh, for the women. I think it's incredible. Yes. I mean, if you look at, you know, she's been on the top of the game for so long. Now she's a mother. I think it's something that, you know, obviously everyone talks about, but I think there, there's a reason we're talking about it. And I yeah. think it's important. It's and fantastic. It's incredible yeah. what's, what's happening in the, in the women's game. And yesterday, poor Simona Halep, that, you know, lost first round. She said, you know, you have bad days. And I can just try and imagine how much that must hurt. Must be tough. First round and... Oof. Especially after such a great year she's yeah, had. Yeah, true, true, true. Well, listen, Waleed, thanks so much. Reese, thanks for joining us uh, for this last part of the conversation. And Waleed, thank well, you. Thanks for the opportunity, and I uh, yep. hope to see you all on courts. That's oh, right. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see you on courts, and, and we'll do this again. We'll get you back in for an update. Well, with pleasure. Maybe, maybe this that. time next year. I'd love to do that. Thank right. you all. All right, thanks thank you. That's a wrap on this episode of The Medium Rules with Alan Baldishin. For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And don't forget to rate us on Apple Podcasts.